Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out. Bye. 
I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my seated. Thank you so much for the joy of being together today, for your being here. I hope that this has been a good week for you and that you are looking forward to the presence of God in your life, no matter what comes your way this coming. With, this has not been an easy week for Debbie and I. We've kind of struggled. There are family issues going on and and we haven't really helped one another like, you know, you, that usually the, usually one of us up and one of us down and we help each other. What happens when you're both down? You ever have those kind of relationships when, yep. when uh, you're trying your best and it just doesn't seem to go right? But the, the beautiful thing about that is when tough times come, when you're, when you're walking in the Lord, when you're walking with the Lord, with a brother or a sister in Christ, there always seems to be ways of getting through those times. And, and I, I think we underestimate many times the goodness of God. God is so good. We, we, we sing that little chorus. Remember this chorus we used to sing? God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. is it always good to us sometimes the people around us aren't always good to us life isn't good to us life happens right but through it all God is good Amen. trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path so if you're going through a tough time God's still with you and he will bring you through. The, uh, the first uh, pastor and his wife that we worked with way back when, when we were just youngsters, like those kids back in the corner, <laughs> she said to us one day, uh, one cold winter day in southern Indiana, it must have been that winter of 78. Do you remember that? They went, no, the pastor doesn't. The winter of 78, which is, if we, you Floridians would know, but we, we were snowed in for a week or something like that. It just snow everywhere. 
She said, remember, youngins, whatever happens to you in life and in ministry, remember these four words, this too shall pass. And uh, that's true. So hang in there. Trust in God. God is good. God is faithful. Enough of that. Thank you for supporting the life of this congregation and the ministry that it has. We're going to ask uh, Ashes to come and wait upon us now as we bring our tithes and offerings. Father God, we thank you so much that we can trust you. You are good. You are faithful. We love you, and we thank you for the opportunity to be here, to give, and to share our love for you with you as the people of God. In Jesus' name, amen.
church this morning before I, I go to the sermon. Um, if you would look, I know I talk about this pretty much every week, that's, that's better. Um, we have prayer requests on the, on the back of the bulletin. Um, before I go to the, to the congregational prayer this morning, um, I want you to, I, I've said this before, I kind of want you to just clear your mind. I want you to really focus on whether it's something that's in your life right now that you're dealing with, or maybe it's a, it's a loved one that hasn't come to know Christ as Savior. I want you to completely clear your mind this morning. I want you to focus on that one prayer request. We have several of them on the back, and I want you to remember those as well. But this morning, I know each of us has one that, that's just been there, that's just been stuck. And we really want to focus on that for our friends and our family. So as we pray this morning, think about that. Clear your mind of whatever you have going on this afternoon and focus on that one prayer request. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the ability to gather as family, brothers and sisters, Lord. We, we, just, we love our church family. We love being here. And so we thank you for a place to gather. Lord, each one of us right now has something on our mind, something on our heart. Many, many of us, it's unsaved loved ones. So we pray for them this morning. Lord, it's such a blessing to see so many people back this week, uh, some of our winter visitors. It's, it's wonderful to have them back. And for those that are still yet to come, Lord, we pray for safe travels for them as they return home to Florida. Lord, as, as we continue to grow, uh, we look around the church this morning and we see, we see children, we see kids. We didn't dismiss for, for youth today. It's the fifth Sunday. And so Children's Church is put on pause so they can have time to worship with the, the adults and the teenagers alike. Lord, it's such a blessing to, to be in your presence. And so, Lord, as far as the message is concerned, we turn this entire service over to you. Thank you for the beautiful worship that's already been played and, and the way we'll close the service. God, this entire service we give to you. We pray that you'll bless it. And it's in your holy, precious name we, play, we pray. Amen. We're going to turn that feedback down because I'm getting a ton up here. I don't know if you guys are getting that, so I'm going to turn those down. I don't need to hear myself. I want you all to hear me, but I don't need to hear myself. <clears throat> well, it's funny, like I said, when I talked about uh, Trunk or Treat yesterday, Fifth Sunday, we have so many um, children that are in the congregation. If you look around, you'll see the children over there. I think it's important for them to, to be able to be a part of the service. Yes, we, we do a great job of, of feeding them back there, and I don't mean feeding them physically, which we do, but feeding them spiritually so they're able to grow up and understand what it's like to sit in the congregation. You know, when you look around and you see everyone from the age of a newborn that's in the back to, you know, my children over here and so, uh, some of the other children we have that are, you know, eight, nine, all the way up to the youth in the back that are young adults, um, it's signs of life in the church. It's so beautiful to be able to see people coming to church and coming to know the Lord. And so I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful for all of you for loving on them and being a part of that. So again, thank you for the turnout for Trunk or Treat and everybody being a part of that. Um, this morning, we are going to be in the ninth week of our sermon series. I think I've explained to you all, we're going to just take the Hero series and run it right into Advent. And I, I'm excited about it. And last week we talked about Joshua, for those of you who are here, those of you that watched online, and how he succeeded Moses, how he led the Israelites to the promised land. Talked about how he was hailed as a leader that is studied by both Christians and non-Christians alike. We we're able to, to dive in and talk about going from an observer or non-Christian to one who is fully engaged, one that is leading their family their friends, their loved ones to know Christ. If that's not you this morning, I pray that it is soon. Every one of you, as you continue to know the Lord more, it is your calling, it is your duty biblically to lead your family to Christ. At some point you can say, you know, I didn't come from a Christian home. I didn't know who God was. You know, my, fam my parents weren't that way. My grandparents weren't that way. That's okay because it just takes one person to break that generational gap. To be able to say, you know what, this is where I take a stand and I lead my family to know our Lord and Savior. And so I pray that that's you. I pray that you're setting that good example, that you're having Bible studies, that you're getting to know, and most importantly, being here at church with your brothers and sisters in Christ. But one thing we weren't really able to talk about, maybe that's because of lack of time or because I wanted to split it up, is the situations that took place within the story 
of the book of Joshua. Without this happening, we would not have never been able to see Joshua succeed in all he did. The walls of Jericho would have never came tumbling down if this next hero in particular wasn't mentioned or talked about. Anybody have an idea who I'm going to talk about this week? Rahab. Anybody know who Rahab is? Nod your heads, I hope you do. If not, we're, you're going to learn today. First verse I'm going to talk about today is James chapter 2, verses 25 and 26. I know it's New Testament, but the name is mentioned immediately. It says this, In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Rahab, right? As you know, one thing that I have emphasized, and I promise you I will continue to emphasize it even after being here a year, is faith turning in to action. That we as Christians, yes, we are saved through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, but if that sacrifice and our faith in him does not turn into us doing something, then it's all for nothing. Committing our lives to Christ is about a life change. Yes, that life change, it, it takes place internally. We, we are changed from the inside out. But every one of us at some point has to take that faith and put it into action. It's about people being able to, to look into our lives and seeing physical evidence of, of a life change taking place. Now, you can have people say, you know, I've been changed. I'm completely radically changed. I wear a cross. I do this. I do that. But if you don't see the change, if that change isn't put into action, then there was there really ever a change at all? So it's no wonder that when we talk about Rahab, when James addresses the link between faith and works, he mentions two people specifically. He talked about Abraham and his decision to offer his son Isaac on the altar. We talked about that a few weeks ago. And then in doing so, he was putting that faith into action. Then he mentions Rahab and the fact that she gave lodging to the spies when she did not have to. Now, no one is surprised to to see James reference to to Abraham, right? That doesn't shock any of us, the, the father of the faithful. But how many would have thought when Paul penned this that it would include Rahab. She's been called Rahab the harlot, Rahab the prostitute. But yet in Hebrews 11, in verses 30 and 31, Paul talks about the heroes of faith and he writes this. It says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell, after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith The prostitute Rahab, because she she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Now, ladies, I think you're going to enjoy this this morning. I think you're going to wholeheartedly agree with me with my next point. In my opinion, in my pastoral opinion, one of the most overlooked items in all of Scripture is the role that women play. I'm going to be 100% honest with you. Women in the Bible, they play a very prominent role throughout. I feel oftentimes we overlook those important people in the Bible because men wrote the books in the Bible, right? When we look at the the 12 highlighted disciples in the Bible, they're all men. But this fact doesn't make the role of women any less important than that of the men that are portrayed time and time again. We have to realize that women were what? They were created from the rib of man. And honestly, this is completely true of my wife anyway, but most of the time, your wives are your better half. See, my wife completes me. When I, like, like you both talked about a few minutes ago, Paul and Debbie, a lot of times when she's up, I'm down, and she's able to balance that. When I'm up and she's down, I'm able to counterbalance that. We complete each other. We really help in our spiritual walk to be able to help each other to be able to pray when the other one's weak. It's very, very important in the lives of a husband and wife who call themselves Christians. She's my partner in ministry. I've said this many, many times, right? She does everything that she can to support me. My wife had a, a wonderful job in Ohio, but when we took this leap of faith to come here a year ago, she said, you know what? This is where God's calling us. I'm in. Let's go. 
And, and she trusted that God would provide, and God has provided. Look at the church, look at the people. He's blessing our congregation, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Honestly, and I'm going to say this right, men, don't, don't throw things at me yet. Nine times out of ten, women make our lives easier. I'm just going to leave it at that. There's that 10% of the time sometimes they don't. But nine times out of ten, they make our lives easier, right? Is it any wonder that when Jesus died on the cross, when Jesus died on the cross, that there were four women attending to him in his last few moments on earth? A lot of you didn't know that, right? I'm not sure if you know this or not, but only two women are called on by name in Hebrews chapter 11, the heroes of faith. Those two women are Sarah and Rahab. And I'm also not sure if you know this fact, but Rahab was one of the ancestors of Jesus mentioned in the genealogy of Christ in the very first chapter of Matthew. As a matter of fact, Rahab was the great-great-grandmother of King David. A lot of you didn't know that either. So obviously the story in heroism of Rahab deserves our serious, serious attention, in my opinion. Now our hero from last week, Joshua, so we're going to get into the story now. So our hero last week, Joshua, he sent out two men to spy secretly on Jericho, right? For those of you Bible historians, you know Jericho was a very, very important city in the Bible, Jericho was situated near the Jordan, and the Canaanites could plainly see the nearly three million Israelites camped on the plain across the river. The people in the city, they, they likely understood that their new neighbors, they weren't there to be friends. A lot of times if you see another entire group of people coming to a city, they assume there's going to be a fight, there's going to be something happening, and they assume this wasn't for a good thing. They had heard how God had miraculously delivered them from slavery in Egypt. They had heard about the, the parting of the Red Sea. They had heard how the Israelites conquered other nations with the one true God leading the way. And I'll tie that into our faith this morning. A lot of us here, we, you know, we didn't grow up under the tutelage of a pastor. We didn't visit church until later in life. So we had to have somebody in our life that, that knew the one true God, that was able to mentor us, that was able to help us transform in who we were. Now, did that person do it all themselves? Absolutely not. They gave us advice. They pointed us to verses and things like that. And God ultimately changed us. But we had to have somebody point us to that. And that was the one true God. So no wonder the people of Jericho, they were a tad bit anxious about Israel's presence in their backyard. To be honest, it freaked most of them out. And like any good military leader, Joshua decided to, to send spies to go within the walls and see what kind of defense they were working with and how hard it would be to conquer them. Now, I can promise one thing. These spies, although they ended up in a, a very promiscuous part of town, if we mentioned Rahab and her profession, they were not on a pleasure-seeking mission. You see, in these, these pagan cultures, these big houses by the city gates, they would often serve the city hotel as the city hotel for, for traveling caravans. Rahab and her family, they operated one of these inns at one of the most accessible points of the wall. Often these, and I'll put in quotations, rooms had a little emphasis on the word bed for the right price. I think we all know what that means. That's how Rahab got her title. So when the spies came to Rahab's inn and, and lodged there, the king was alerted almost immediately because those spies, they stuck out like a sore thumb. They didn't fit in. They didn't look like the others. In Joshua chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, it says this. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. Now, as we all know, this is one of the things that, that Rahab does that she is well known for. See, Rahab, she lived with these awful people. 
She committed awful acts almost daily, and she was completely engulfed in sin most of her life. However, she lived there. It was her home. She was one of them. But by aligning herself with God's people instead of her own, she was putting herself and her family in harm's way, even though she was doing the right thing. Why would she do this? What would make her take such a a risk for her family? What would make her take a risk that she could possibly be killed for? You see, Rahab, again, she had heard about the God of the Israelites. She was very intrigued by the other religions, but they didn't make sense to her. So when they mentioned to her, nothing moved her like this God did. She heard about those miracles taking place and, and the power that the Lord possessed. See, for many of us, our first experience in church, we've heard about God doing something in somebody's life. Some of my favorite things that I've witnessed over the years is God curing somebody of cancer. I've seen God take away pain in people. I've seen God, you know, do these amazing things. And then I've seen the greatest act of all. I've seen God completely transform a sinner who you never thought in a million years would change their life to come to be something new. That's the God I've witnessed. That's the God that intrigued me and made me want to move. So Rahab, she heard about this, and she really thought to herself, this God must truly love his people in order to perform these signs and wonders. This was the kind of God that Rahab wanted her family to serve. This was the kind of God that she could see herself worshiping. Think about what was going on in Rahab's life. Think about how that mirrors our lives today. Here she was stuck in this world of sin, surrounded by people that served false religions, false idols. You might not walk outside today and see somebody worshiping a golden calf, no. But you're going to walk outside today and you're going to see people worshiping money, worshiping themselves, worshiping football teams. You're going to see people worshiping false idols right? So the same thing that happened back then is still happening today. And the scary part about it, again, just like today, everyone around her tells her that it's okay. Just like they tell you, it's okay. Everyone's doing it, so you can do it too. It's the same thing we experience today. So many people have turned everything that is right, that is beautiful with the word of God, and they've turned it upside down. They've done it to to fit their twisted perspective on what makes them feel good or gives them pleasure. Everybody, when they do these things, they want to be told, it's okay, I'm not going to judge you too harshly, or, you know, God will, will forgive that one, that's fine. And so they just keep doing it, and they keep doing it, and they engulf themselves in it, and they're perfectly fine with it. And the same thing was taking place in the time of Rahab. And even though these these very same things, then and today, are detestable in the eyes of God, they continue to proceed to do them anyway. So in my opinion, I believe Rahab, she had been praying for a way out. How many of you at some point in your life had just fell to your knees or just gone there again? We had prayer a moment ago praying for family members said, you know what? I'm done. I can't live like this anymore. I can't feel like this anymore. Lord, I need a way out. I think we've all been there. I don't think we'd be here this morning if we hadn't been there at some point. And I think Rahab was in the same way. She wanted a way out. She was sick of experiencing chaos She was sick of experiencing heartache. She didn't want to be weighed down by the sin that she was committing every single day in her life any longer. The same way the Lord still shows us signs today, Rahab took those spies showing up on her doorstep as a sign from God that things for her family and and her were about to change for the better. So when those soldiers... We're barricading the city walls. The only hope that she had was, the only hope that they had, I should say, was to trust a pagan prostitute that they would save them. It goes perfectly in line with all the heroes we've been talking about recently, right? God uses the ordinary. 
Every one of you, every one of you that right now is thinking, well, pastor, that was Rahab, great, great grandmother to King David. I'm not that. It's telling you that God uses the ordinary. Every one of us, I'm, I, we're all ordinary. God uses the ordinary to do extraordinary things. I've had many people ask me, how could, how could God bless Rahab though, right? She was lying. In that moment, she was lying, which, which technically is a sin, pastor. And that sin is the very thing that she's most famous for. But we must remember, church, the Bible is it's full of fallen people. We as a church, we are a group of fallen and broken people. If I were to take a poll right now and say, how many of you in this room lied at some point? Maybe it was a little white lie, maybe it was a joke, lied at some point this week. Most of us would be putting our hand up. We're fallen, broken people. But God does amazing things with the broken to advance the kingdom of God. And this was no different. Yes, Rahab was dishonest. And honestly, as sinful as she was, she may not have known in the early stages that what she was doing was wrong. And the best part is God forgave Rahab just as he forgives us when we turn our back on him. And after Rahab lied to the soldiers, she returned to the roof to meet the spies. And after expressing her faith, Rahab, the best part is she wasn't just concerned. Again, there's a reason I had that congregational prayer the way I did. Rahab wasn't just concerned with her own salvation, but she was also concerned with the salvation of her family. And like I've told you on the past, once we come to faith, once you all know the Lord, we should be praying the Lord, absolutely thanking Him for saving us. But our next prayer is, Lord, please save my family whom I love. I think it's, this was the big one that spoke to God more than anything. It was her selfless plea for her loved ones to be saved that I think was heard the loudest. You see, my prayer each week. You are my family. You're my church family. It's, I pray for my aunts, my uncles, my people in my family who do, I know without a shadow of a doubt do not know the Lord, that look at me when I preach online, that look at me when I post uplifting Bible verses, that look at me like I'm a crazy lunatic. My prayer is for them. My prayer is that they come to one, know the one true Lord as I do. I'm okay with the world calling me a crazy lunatic. That doesn't offend me. My prayer is also for you and your family. It's that those in your life, those that you hold dear, that you pray for each night, that they will also come to know the Lord. Because I know when we get home and we stand in the presence of our Lord and Savior and we look around, we want to see those that are blood, those that we knew on earth that have given their lives to Christ. So we should be praying that. When we come to know the Lord, that should be our next prayers for those in our life that do not. In Joshua chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, it says this. And listen to this prayer, this outcry from Rahab. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. She wasn't just willing, okay, we'll save you, Rahab, let's get you out. No, she wasn't leaving her family behind. Those of us in the church who have prayed and thought about our family maybe for five years 10 years 30 years and we've thought about oh, they're a lost cause don't give up hope continue to pray for them continue to ask the lord to come into their life all those thanksgivings and christmases you show up and you say my son or daughter they just don't listen to me my brother my sister they don't believe in god and you say you know what i, I can't talk about this at the family meal i don't want to cause trouble don't stop pleading don't stop letting them know who this God is. We're never promised tomorrow. So as the holiday season approaches, even if it seems to create an uncomfortable conversation, put those feelings aside, it's okay. 
I'm willing to have that uncomfortable conversation. If you want to invite me over to your meal, I'll do it too. I'll be the uncomfortable pastor that just sits there and says, hey, do you know about our Lord and Savior Christ? I probably can't show up to every house. That might be a lot. But I'm willing to do that for you. Do you know why? Because you are my family. So by de facto, your family is now my family. So don't stop praying for them. Don't stop having that conversation about Christ What we've just talked about today, this is the story of Rahab's salvation. It is through faith that she was saved. The same faith that we cling to because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, it's only those who have received his word and are in the body of Christ when Jesus comes back that will be spared that final destruction. The last thing I want is for any of your family members any of my family members, those that we love to spend eternity in hell. It's the last thing that I want. Rahab trusted in God and his people. Because of that, she and her family were saved. So as I close this morning, as the band gets ready to come forward, I want you to to listen to these last few verses in Joshua. It's found in chapter 2, verses 17 through 19 says this. Now the men had said to her, this oath you made us swear will this mode you this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house, if any one of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. Church, again, look at what Rahab just did. She, she lowered a red rope out the window, a scarlet cord, right? With which men would safely descend from the high window to, to the ground outside the city. And when they returned, unless that red rope was still hanging from her window... When the Israelites came to conquer the city, no one in that house would be saved. The rope by which she delivered the messengers would be the same rope that delivered Rahab and her loved ones. Might be asking, what, what, what does this red rope represent? Why do you keep talking about this red cord, right? Well, like the Passover blood on the Israelites' doorposts, it indicated their trust in God's mercy. The red cord symbolized Rahab's covenant with Joshua through his messengers. This is the story of salvation. It is through faith that we cling to the red rope, right? The blood of Christ's sacrifice for sin and the ability for us to escape eternal damnation and death. My friends, Rahab's red rope, it's a symbol of faith. We've got to to tie a knot in the promises of God and hang on for dear life. The crimson rope, it was a symbol for the blood of Christ. We have to tie the rope in our window, then tell our family and friends to get back in the house with us. Because like Joshua and his army attacking Jesus, he's coming back. He's coming soon with his army of angels to deliver those who have stretched out that red rope of faith. We need to step up We need to be that unlikely hero, that hero like Rahab was during her time. So my question, my challenge for you this morning is, can you do that today? I challenge you to step up and step out this week. Don't leave and let another sermon go by, another week go by, another month go by, another Christmas go by. Break the trends that the world is comfortable with. Be the hero you were called to be for your family and friends. That's what Joshua asked of Rahab and what Jesus is asking from you. Will you be the one to lead your family to Christ, just as Rahab led her family to the Lord? Will you be the one to break the the sinful trend that runs so deep in every single one of our families? That is my prayer for each one of you this week. Will you pray the same for your family? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Lord, thank you for the story of Rahab. Thank you for your beautiful word. Thank you for 
Each and every person that came out this morning and those watching online, Lord, every one of us, every single one of us here today has somebody in our family who does not believe. Somebody who has given us heartache, who gives us heartbreak constantly because we know that they do not know the Lord like we do. So Lord, those of us that are maybe on the fence about faith, I pray for them. I pray for us. I pray for the people in this church who are are wrestling with their own life and their relationship with you. Lord, secondly, for those of us that know you securely, those of us that know you firmly, I pray that they are praying and interceding on behalf of their loved ones, their family, their brothers, their sisters, their mothers, their fathers, their children, and grandchildren. Lord, help us to be the change. Help us to be the light. Help us to break the lineage, the curse that resides within that. Lord, as we play the last song, We dedicate it to you. This message, this service, the prayers that we're all going to take to you this week, we give them to you. Do with them as you may. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Shall we stand as we face this week and the days before us? Let's seek the Lord with all our heart. up here. Let's try this. You're my friend. There we go. My friend and you are my brother even though you are Becky, will you keep that up? Put that last slide back up there. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. They say you set an example by the way you are, by the way you act, the things that you do. So when your family this season sees you, when you talk about your faith, when you tell them that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, when you say you put him above all else, do they see that in you? You alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship you. Because if they don't see it in you, they're not going to buy it for them. They need to see that in you more than anything else. So this season, as we approach Thanksgiving and Christmas and you get to spend that time with those loved ones that do not know God, let them know that He is your heart's desire. That you do long to worship Him above everything else in this world. Amen? Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. 
Thank you for every single person here today. Thank you for those watching online. As we leave this morning, Lord, we give it all to you. For those of us that have been lacking in our faith, I pray that we can take the next step, that we can come back to you, that we can repent of the, the things we've done, the way we've been caught up in the world, Lord. It's okay because we can repent for that and we can get back on track. So Lord, we, a congregation here at Spirit Lake, we give our lives to you again this morning. Use us as you may to influence family, friends, and community. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.